everybody. Welcome back to Keto and Crime, where we're going to dive into another dystopian thriller for this 31 days of Keto Wayne. Today, we're looking at the second in the Purge franchise, Heartbounding and Intense World of the Purge Anarchy. If you're a fan of dystopian thrillers, you're in for a treat. Grab your popcorn. Let's get started. Let's pause for a brief message from the sponsor of today's video. Coffee brand coffee. The purge. I mean, let's face it. Fall is here. It's colder. It's darker. And you just need that inner warm up. Well, how do I get mine? And that is from my good friend Jeremy and his great crew over at Coffee Brand Coffee. Go to coffeebrandcoffee.com for the best selection of light, medium, dark roast, flavored coffees, cold brews, hot chocolate teas these things are awesome and they are shipped conveniently to your door with huge discounts for auto ship and free shipping so if you're a coffee lover like me and i start my day with two 20 ounce mugs of coffee without fail and then i just go can go up or down from there but they've got everything from light to medium dark roast they've even got two time caffeine if you really need that picked me up. But I'm more basic over here. Y'all know that from watching me. And I am a fan of the flavored coffees. They've got bourbon, blueberry cobbler, strawberries and cream. This will change your life. And the Dreamsicle, Creamsicle is great as well. S'mores is awesome. And they've got a brand new brand uh, coming out just for uh, the fall. And that is the Sicky Cinnamon Bun. And they've got the Spiked Jack-O-Lantern, which is their take on pumpkin spice. Let me just tell you, all of these are great. I have the strawberries and cream every day, and it is awesome. So just a little bit of cream, a little bit of monk fruit sweetener, and I am literally in heaven. I can't say enough good things about Coffee Brand Coffee. No politics, no gimmicks, just great coffee every time, and delivered conveniently to your door. And if you use my code, Keto and Crime, you will get 10% off of your order. So if you love coffee, give it a try. And thanks so much to Jeremy and Coffee Brain Coffee for sponsoring this video. Anarchy is the second installment of the highly acclaimed Purge film series. This movie was released in 2014, just a year after the original The Purge in 2013. Again, it is written and directed by James DeMonico. The movie takes the premise of the first film, which was isolated to one neighborhood in a wealthy area, and expands it to a grander scale in a urban city here, Los Angeles. It takes it to the streets, characters of all socioeconomic status, and we really see the grander political horror coming into play here as the NFFA's plan to eliminate all of those not useful to the government starts to flesh out in this movie right here. So just a brief recap, uh, we're set in a future possible dystopian America that does not follow our own presidential election timeline, so it is a different America but is kind of a shadow of what, what could occur if a totalitarian government ever takes over, but once a year for 12 hours, March 21st to March 22nd, 12 hours from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., all crime, including murder, is legal, with the exception of high-ranking political officials, of course. Um, and it serves as a way for the government to control crime and release societal tensions, which they say equals the good trajectory the country is on. Prior to the purge, the country was in the toilet, evidently. So, the purge anarchy follows a group of unrelated individuals who will eventually become related as the story progresses and as they struggle to survive the sixth annual purge, which began on March 21st, 2023. So, this is currently set in our current year. And it begins with video of a successful anti-purge resistance group led by partners Carmela Jones, played by Michael K. Williams, and Dante Bishop, portrayed again here by Edwin Hodge from the original The Purge film. He is one of just a couple of actors that appeared in more than one uh, 
installment of this franchise. In the original, he was simply known as the Bloody Stranger. But basically, these two are tech are tech savvy and they have hijacked government feeds to denounce the new founding fathers and their actions and they are letting the poor and middle class know that this is just a scheme to take them out and for the rich and elite and the government to use them. So let's delve into the characters. Our protagonists include Leo Barnes, portrayed by Frank Grillo. He is a man that we will learn later in the third installment in this franchise that he is a has a security and law enforcement background. But here he is se simply a man seeking revenge for a personal tragedy. Also, he encounters Eva Sanchez, played by Carmen Iogo, and her daughter Callie, played by Z Zoe So, who become trapped outside during the purge and are desperately trying to survive. There's also a subplot where Eva's father has basically sold himself for $100,000 to a rich family so that they can purge him, and they end up outside on purge night trying to find him and tell him not to do that. Then we're introduced to Shane and Liz, portrayed by Zach Guilford and Kaylee Sanchez, they are a couple that's on the verge of separation and divorce, whose car breaks down, leaving them vulnerable in the chaos that is L.A. on Purge Night. So, after Carmelo and Dante's video plays, we, are, we cut to a scene involving a 17-year-old Callie and a, her terminally ill grandfather Rico who have been watching the video and agree very much with the sentiments behind it. Out in Los Angeles, Callie's mother Ava is returning from her waitress job and when they return they live in a very low income section 8 housing, housing complex. They lock themselves in, they make sure they have food, water, everything that they need and then Rico retires to his room to be alone as he just says he can't stand the purge, he just wants to sleep through it. Then that infamous purge alarm sounds, and after it sounds, Rico slips out of the apartment into a waiting limousine. He leaves a note for his family telling them that he has sold himself to that rich family in exchange for $100,000 that will be paid to Ava's bank account after the purge, and so they find it, they are distraught, and then they head out trying to find him before this happens. However, there is a brief cut where it shows Rico in the home of this very rich family. They are in a huge house behind one of those uh, Sandlin security systems. Very, very safe, gated community. And it shows him alone in a room with about six family members with plastic and everything else up because God forbid you should ruin their furniture. And they are standing around him with weapons. So we are immediately shown that Rico is the first victim that we're shown in this purge. Then we cut to Shane and Liz. Uh, they are going to a grocery store to get a few supplies before the purge began. And they kind of get trapped when a masked gang of skateboarders and dirt biters start harassing them. They try to avoid them and then their car breaks down only to find out that this gang has cut a line under their car and caused them to break down. And then we cut to Leo Barnes, who is on his way to seek revenge on a man named Warren Grass, who inadvertently ran down and killed his son Nicholas in a drunk driving accident in 2022. Uh, Grass was evidently acquitted on a legal technicality and despite Nicholas's death. So his ex-wife Janice has been begging him not to carry this out, but he feels that it's his right, and he is armed with a lot of weapons, has armored his car, and he is definitely going to take out his vigilante rights on the evening of the purge. Uh, Shane and Liz are now trying to find a safe hiding place. The purge commences, and then... We cut back to Ava and Callie outside their apartment building. As the purge began, they get scared, and then they notice what appears to be some kind of militia group um, amassing in the street in front of their building, and they realize that some of these people are wearing NFFA patches, 
And so they reason that th these are some sort of government operatives. And so that scares them enough to head back into their building. And there they are harassed by the building superintendent, who's just a low life among low lives. And he is mad at Ava because she has rejected his advances. And he plans to break into their apartment and assault both of them. However, before he can do that, this paramilitary group filled with all kinds of mercenaries, white supremacists, you name it, break into this building and begin going floor to floor executing people in the building. So this is where we start seeing that plan of the NFFA taking out low-income people. As I said, this is a low-income housing unit in Los Angeles. So he ends up being purged by this group and that allows Ava and Callie to flee after uh, getting out after getting away from Diego the superintendent now when they get outside they notice a large truck with its back end open and a mercenary that is known in this film as Big Daddy played by actor Jack Conley shooting people with a l large machine gun from the back of the truck. He also seems to be in charge of a particular group of gangs, which include the bikers and skateboarders that had harassed our married couple earlier. Now, this is where our heroes come together. Basically, Leo passes the scene where he sees Big Daddy taking a taking aim at the two women and he rescues them by killing several of big daddy's gang and wounding big daddy which causes big daddy to flee when they return to leo barnes car he offers to give them a ride someplace safe inside we find the married couple shane and liz who have managed to get away from the gang and are now hiding in leo's car uh, leo begins to wonder why do i need these people and tells them to get out but however eva says that she can if he if he will help them get to her co-worker's apartment he can get them another car as his car has now been damaged in the attack from the street gang as they wander the streets heading for eva's friend's apartment they notice that not only are government operatives out but also these individual gangs kidnapping people which this will become a storyline later and purging people, as well as Carmelo and Dante's anti-purge activists are out, and they are armed as well. So this is a three-prong war going on on the streets, and they see a lot of government operatives as well as individual purge groups that have been gunned down and killed by the anti-purge forces. After several ensuing battles, they manage to kill a few purgers themselves they're trying to kill them and then they finally get to ava's friend's apartments whose name is tanya she takes them in ava tells leo that she's sorry she lied there is no car she just wanted to get them all over but please stay with them leo gets enraged and is about to leave however within tanya's house um, a domestic situation breaks out when uh, tanya's sister lorraine Percent proceeds to murder Tanya, claiming that she's been sleeping with her husband. And then the family breaks out and pretty much kills each other. Of course, our group, Leo, Shane, Liz, Ava, and her daughter, Callie, leave this situation immediately and decide to stick together. While out and about, where they are assaulted by gangs working for Big Daddy, and they are taking, taken prisoner and then transported to an unknown location where they are auctioned off to very rich families. Again, hearkening back what happened to Rico in the beginning, heart basically auctioned off to the highest bidder so that they can hunt them in a safe environment where they are giving no weapons. They are inside this arena. Think the Hunger Games. Think Battle Royale. And where these rich people can purge in pretty much safety because these purgees have no way of fighting back. So the entire group is purchased. They are put into this little arena and a fight ensues. During it, Leo manages to subdue and kill a couple of the rich purgers taking weapons and night vision goggles. And then just when it seems like all 
all hope is lost. Carmelo, Dante, and some of the anti-purge forces break in and even the score, killing the rich purgers as well as chasing after some of the rich attendees that are simply watching. However, during the scuffle, Shane, the husband of our husband and wife duo, is killed by some of the rich purgers. And after Liz sees him die, they were hopefully on their way to healing their, you know, healing their relationship through trauma. She decides she wants to purge. So Leo, Callie, and Ava leave her with Carmelo and Dante, who say they will take care of her. She's given a weapon so that she can kill some of the purgers that killed her husband. So you see how this rage virus, kind of like in 28 Days Later, is just spreading. So basically, Leo, Liz, Leo, Ava, and Callie leave. They get to a parking complex where they accost another of the rich purgers and take a vehicle. They then drive to a suburban neighborhood to the home of Warren Grass, even though Eva and Callie are begging him just to let it go. But he breaks into the Grass home at 655 and holds both Grass and his wife at gunpoint. We then cut to outside the house just before the purge ends at 7 a.m., wondering what happened. And then we see Leo emerge, not knowing whether he killed Grass or not. And then he is shot by Big Daddy, who has tracked them there. He's not letting them get away with killing so many of his group. And then, basically, this is where it all shows that everybody's in, you know, both the government and private citizens in for making Purge not very profitable. And just as Big Daddy, the the women rush to Leo's side, but before they can get there, a shot rings out from behind Leo, shooting Big Daddy dead, and we turn around to see it is indeed Warren Grass. Leo has had a change of heart and spared him, and as a reward, Grass has saved his life. And that is where the purge anarchy ends, with Ava and Liz getting, Ava and Callie, excuse me, getting Leo to a hospital as the siren sounds and the sixth annual purge ends. And now let's get to our conversation. Taquito and crime. As always, I have my two good best friends here, uh, Brentley from uh, Dangerous Rhetoric and Brian from the Front Porch Conservative. We are moving on to the second movie in the Purge series known as The Purge Anarchy. And I'll tell everybody, uh, we'll tell everybody where, where we can find everybody at the end. I think everybody knows you over here. So uh, we'll put, all your links will be down below. So let's dive right into the movie. You should have just come out of my little review of it uh, before this. So uh, let's talk about it. Brian, give us your initial thoughts. Um, it's a little, definitely a little bit different than the, than the uh, original Purge movie in that mm -hmm. as opposed to focusing on one family, we now have something that you know modern cinema has brought us and that's the idea of we're bringing these convergent persons and groups together to form one you know one group that's going to like try to find and work their way out of a situation for my part i thought the acting was solid i thought yeah. frank grillo in the role of sergeant was fantastic mm -hmm. um the the chemistry between ava the mother which is played by carmen ijogo Yep. And Callie, which is Zoe Saul, they were very solid together. Um, very believable as mother and daughter. Yes, absolutely. Same thing with uh, Liz and Shane, which is Liz is played by an actress named Kylie Sanchez and Shane's played by Zach Guilford. I mean, all the chemistry between the actors was good. Um, side, side note, they're married in real life. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Did yeah. not know that. But, you know, that, then that starts to explain some of it. I mean, the chemistry yeah. was good between the actors and the actresses. Um, this film's different in that there's a lot of different themes that you can get into and discuss. And you also get the sense, particularly toward the end of the film, that things are being set up for future movies that are coming out. I mean, for example, you hear the initials, the NFFA, and then you have the group that's, um, that's, um, headed up by the character of Carmelo Jones, who's played mm -hmm. by Michael Kenneth Williams. And you also get different themes. One one thing that I'll, and we'll probably get into this later, but I'll just dive right into it now since I'm already here. There was one line, and you guys may remember this, the, the dinner party where 
the auction is taking place. And then um, Frank Frank Grillo's character, the sergeant, yeah. takes out a bunch of these really bad guys. Mm -hmm. The head lady is calling someone on the phone saying, we need help. We need help right now. They killed five of us. And that line struck me so because it's like in this society, there's now a differentiation. It's not even between the rich versus the poor, per se. It's between the hunters and the hunted. And and the and the basis upon which you become the hunted is that yes, there is money, there's a money factor involved in it, but it just that line there killed five of us. Yeah. Not not because you see five, in that group. Yeah. I mean, we didn't see what kind of money, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the the married couple made. Uh but they had a you know, a basic car like a a, a Corolla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Leo, Leo wasn't hurting. He had a nice apartment, had a nice car. He definitely tricked it out, made it look yeah. like the Batmobile. So oh, he yeah. was definitely, you know, he was a LA cop. So we definitely, you know, these were middle class, solid middle class people. I mean, okay, mm -hmm. Ava was a waitress, so they were more working class. But mm -hmm. these were middle, solid middle, maybe even upper middle class people that were not part of us. Yeah, the the, the part when when he rolled that car out of the parking garage my first reaction was and i think he's actually played this character somewhere else the punisher mm -hmm. i kept seeing that car and i kept thinking man if this isn't like something straight out of the punisher i don't know what is yeah. um I, I thought i thought on the whole and i know that the three of us had talked about this from the last time that there did this didn't feel like at least to me anyway it didn't feel like it had a lot of plot holes in it that you're sitting there going Oh come on! You guys are really stretching credibility here. Now there's there's the overall complaint which which Brent has, has spoken about previously, and that is, can you really believe that there you know the crimes being reduced by all this, and we're just doing this one night of purging, and this cures everything? So I mean that criticism is still there, and I understand it. But to me, I mean the plot felt solid. Mm -hmm. You know there wasn't a whole lot. You know it's not like we're talking Lawrence of Arabia style screenwriting here, but I mean as far as a good solid story. It just, it's really well put together. I enjoyed the film. I genuinely did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, that that major overhanging plot hole and would people actually stop, you know, when the when the horn blasts telling them that it's over, you know, if they're inclined to do that. And then everything else, I mean, I hadn't seen the movie in about a year. And so rewatching it, I caught... A lot of things that I didn't notice the first couple of times I watched it. And I was still like still semi shocked, you know, at some of the twists that that came out, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Brentley, what do you think? Your first thoughts. Um, so the first thing that I noticed was that this was not a horror movie. It was definitely more of like an action chase, like like the whole film basically follows the story of these like five or six characters as they are pursued relentlessly by you know perjurers mm -hmm. and i love how there's this like you know constant dual antagonism there's these like weird you know semi trucks with like dudes with mini guns going around and like mm -hmm. fully geared out like military style bros and you're like what's going on there and then on the other hand, there's these like dudes that just look like uh, like gangsters in, you know, they have a big box truck and then they're all hanging out on like motorcycles and wearing. Yeah, like, these, these are really the people behind masks. me. <laughs> yeah. So these got those guys in the poster. And uh, so like these the whole time they're being pursued by these two different groups and then the, inevitably they collide. And, and they got uh, Carmela's uh, resistance fighters, too, is another group. And you would have to say that the 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 dead like people in the truck they found were probably killed by Carmelo's people. So you're like, who the F do I trust in this world? You know? <laughs> yeah. So there's all these like different competing factions and it's clear that everybody is hostile. Mm -hmm. So basically the, the trope here is that it's like out of the frying pan into the fire and it's over and over and over again. So that was the one thing I noticed as you know, I watched, uh, you know, Frank Grillo take these guys through. And then the other thing was, that what Brian already said, it, the movie feels, he feels very much like the Punisher. Um, everything about that character is Punisher vibes, even including the fact that he's trying to avenge the death of his son. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very similar to what happens to the character in, in the Punisher. Uh, also the car. And I think, I, I feel like Guerrillo did play him in like the Netflix series, maybe or yeah, something. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking he did. 
I feel like he did. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I'm totally like, you know, hallucinating there because I was looking at his IMD page, uh, IMDB page, and I could not. I don't and see he's it. Also, he's also one of the couple of actors, along with Dante, who's back in this one as well, The Stranger, that actually plays in more than one Purge movie. So he's in the third one as well. Purge oh, he election. comes back. Awesome. Yeah, Frank Grillo's in the third one, too. Yeah, Ooh. he almost got killed at the end, but then yeah. he didn't. <laughs> He didn't. <laughs> well, I Thanks mean, to that shot twist up. ending. Thanks to that M. Night. What I used to think was a when I first saw it, it was like, well, that was M. Night Shalaman. Oh, okay. <laughs> he played. He was Rumlo. That's where I've seen him before. He was Rumlo in the Marvel movies. Yep. Yep. Um, he was also in The Gray, and a whole bunch of stuff. Wow, he's been in a lot of shit. The Shield, Minority Report. Okay. Dang, this guy's gotten around. Oh, it doesn't seem like you. I, I mean, I guess I just hallucinated the fact that he played the Punisher in something. See, well, being I in keep... Marvel movies, it's easy to get all those all the hero. I guess stuff it is. He, he has the look too. It's really the look. He just, you know, he looks like a Punisher. Um, but I, I ooh, thought the car. Was, you know, the car was a nice addition. And what we're talking about, if you haven't seen the movie, you know, there's spoilers ahead. He's decked out his normal car in a. Uh, with all kinds of armor and stuff like that. It looks like a Batmobile rolling through the city. Right. Okay. There's a new movie he's in called Boss Level, which is like a Groundhog Day style murder that he has to solve. He has to like solve his own murder as the day repeats oh, wow. and repeats and repeats. Mm. I'm going to check that out. Boss Level. It's on Hulu, apparently. Mm, cool. Interesting. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I really enjoyed the, the Purge Anarchy. I also like how it started to get into the political um aspect of it you know spoiler alert like the semi trucks are actually like these like government agent dudes going around like engaging in targeted purges where they like find you know like these, like, houses and yeah. yeah and they like just send their dudes in and just like murder everybody drag them out send them to the uh the slaughterhouse where these rich people like pay to go and like kill them in like an arena <laughs> like it's a video game or something yep it's and the, trippy. And this gang behind us, they're actually following the government, the government trucks and getting their cast offs and taking and selling them to rich people for the rich people to kill. And so this, I mean, they're pure capitalists. <laughs> you could, if you, think, you know, if you want to look at it that way. And that's another trope that this, you know, that this movie introduced. We, we first find it with uh, Ava's father, Rico, uh, that he sold himself to a rich family uh, to be purged by them in the safety of their home for $100,000 for his family. He was dying of some disease, and he was worried because their, his medicine, they couldn't really afford it, but she was buying it anyway. And so he sold himself to a family. I I cried the first time I watched the movie when, when I saw what was happening to him because I got attached to him in like the five minutes he was on screen because he reminded me of like a, my kindly old grandpa and i can't imagine you know finding out that my grandfather did that for my family you know right yeah yeah john beasley who plays the role of papa rico is a, mm -hmm. just one of the best character actors in hollywood i mean he's been around forever and a day the, the first thing that i can remember ever seeing him in was years ago it was the general's daughter with John Travolta and Madeline Stowe, where he plays the psychologist up at West Point. Mm -hmm. And and he's had those kind of roles for years. But that scene where he's sitting in the middle of this rich family's living room and there's plastic everywhere and they're standing there holding the machetes kind of semicircled around him. And he has this look of like resigned desperation on his face as just creepy. Yeah, as like he had hell. mentally mentally yeah. checked out because he knew yeah. what was happening. Oh yeah. He he knew what was coming. And a uh, couple of, I mean, you've got the background behind you. The one mm -hmm. character from the motorcycle group is the guy in the hoodie with like the red cross in the middle of his mm -hmm. forehead. I, I, and this is just probably tells how old I am. Every time I see him, I flash back to like live and let die. The, the mm -hmm. first James Bond movie with Roger Moore. And I think mm -hmm. that was James Earl Jones who played that character. The, the witch doctor on the Island. That's exactly mm -hmm. what that guy reminds me of. I swear he does. You know? Yeah. There, he's very Conan the Barbarian. I mean, oh, yeah. in in, oh, yeah. in that way, d definitely. And he mm. does kind of look like James Earl Jones with that mask on. I mean, that mask may be a James Earl Jones mask. Yeah, yeah, it could very well be. And Big Daddy, the guy in the semi truck, um, 
again, another flashback. I'm thinking Snake Eyes from Cool Hand Luke, the mm -hmm. guy with the mirrored sunglasses in the prison. That's mm -hmm. exactly what he reminds me of. I'm like, damn. They drew well, on a lot of different stuff for this. So, so basically we have uh, all these different families from all different socioeconomic uh, conditions. We have uh, Ava and her daughter, uh, their superintendent of their building, which is a Section 8 building. We have to point that out because there's a government kill squad on the way to their building. And uh, the superintendent by the name of Diego evidently has the hots for Ava and she's rejected his advances. So he decides he's going to use the purge to engage in a little bit of S.A. at like the son of a bitch low life he is. And uh, coincidentally and ironically, it's the government kill squad that saves them from that. <laughs> so <laughs> they happen to bust in just as that is about to happen and they kill Diego and then they manage to get away. Thanks to Leo Barnes, uh, who happens to come upon them down down at the truck, and he takes out a bunch of the government people. Oh yeah, I mean the character Diego. I, when I was watching this thing for the second time, I'm like, you are a very sexually frustrated man who is. And, and there was something, and it, it finally hit me. It's like, God, and this guy's not even trying to self improve himself. Yeah. You know, he's not trying to lose weight, dress better, you know, whatever. He's like, okay. Shower? I'm just, I'm, shower yeah, would have been a nice shower? start. Yes, yeah, that would have been a nice start, a shower, you know. But no, you're just going to use your 12 hours of, you know, freedom from conscience, you know, to finally get down with this woman like like a sleazy SOB that you are. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and, and I think that's one of the recurring themes, at least for me, throughout all these movies is like, if you take away the restraint that any society would otherwise normally feel by whatever influence they've got, be it religion, be it norms, be it social custom, and you just turn them loose. What do they devolve down into? And this guy, he's just a, he's just a pardon my French fucking predator. Yeah. You know, he's well, a pig. Interesting. You should say that because, you know, he, he talked about it's my right. It's the, my mm -hmm. right to purge. Mm -hmm. And then you see the prayers that a lot of these rich people are doing and the government people are doing. They're not praying to a deity. They're praying to the new founding fathers as if the new founding fathers party is a deity. So it's like they've allowed society to devolve, taking away regular Christianity, regular Islam, regular uh, Ju Judaism, Judaism and whatever mm -hmm. other religion. And they've replaced it with a political religion that's almost a religion of violence. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah, the holy... Um... The way that they sort of like look at it like a holy act and, and a right and an entitlement is very uh, reminiscent of how psychopaths and other predators view their um, predations on normal people. They see it, you know, because they can do it, they're mm -hmm. superior to us and then they're they're entitled to it. So mm -hmm. in a way, it's almost like a metaphor for that happening like every day at a more mundane level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the action scenes, I have to say, what would y'all think of the overall action, especially with when it, in regards to Leo Barnes? I just thought he was, I thought he was personally awesome, like an action Jackson, <laughs> you know, kind of guy. Yeah, I, I um, the one scene that sticks out to me is the dune buggy in the subway tunnel. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that, that really was. That, that kill with the blow, with the uh, flamethrower, that was the most mm -hmm. memorable kill of the whole of the whole movie. Yeah, the, the other thing that I thought was fascinating, and, and I'm not sure if I call, I mean, obviously I wouldn't call this an action scene because she didn't really do anything, but one of the characters that just stuck out to me is when they're they're slink, I shouldn't say slinking, sneaking down the sides of buildings and up on the roof of this like five-story building is this woman with a megaphone and a machine gun. And she's like, tonight I am the hand of God. I am retribution mm -hmm. on your fucking asses. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, this lady's just, mm, mm -hmm. like, like what Brentley said, definitely a, a psychopath, a sociopath, because because religious delusion comes with that a lot. It's like oh, yeah. Brentley pointed out. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I love the action sequences. I thought they were really excellent, especially that opening scene where he shows up. And like, you know, takes out that whole like squad of dudes that are trying to like purge the mother and daughter duo. That was great. And, and uh, 
Leo Barnes, I, I, I called him a hero by the end, but at first to me, he was more of an anti-hero because you could tell he had something he wanted to get done that night. And right, he, he wanted to kill his son's killer. His killer, right. And he kind of looked at them being, you know, drug out. And he at first you could think, oh, he's just going to drive the other way. He was like, and then he tried to go the other way and he was just like, fuck, <laughs> and had to turn around and go help him. <laughs> and he tried to talk himself out of it. He was like, just keep driving, just keep driving. And then you like watch him as he like, you know, defies his own instructions to himself. Yeah. Well, and, and that's one thing, at least for me in these films, is I love the way that the writers build that one character in that in the midst of all this moral insanity and psychological whatever you want to call it, there's this one person, for whatever reason, they're not a part of the herd. They have not succumbed to the whole... I'm giving myself over to this 12 hours of I can do anything I want. And they're still maintaining some semblance of this is what I was before this purge was ever initiated, however many years ago. And I'm not, I'm going to be, and, and they're not trying to be a hero. They're, it's like you said, he's the anti-hero. They're not trying to be a hero. They're not trying to be some beacon of morality. They're just like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to engage in this. I am not going to succumb to this. You know, I just, I always find that very interesting. Which is what we find out at the end, you know, Big Daddy being a government operative, his whole crew being government operative. And they said, and he literally says that normal people weren't killing enough. So right. mm -hmm. the uh, government had to take it into their own hands, which shows the majority of people in this country are still moral, normal, nonviolent people. And it's just the vocal minority crazies and opportunists that you see out there. Yeah. Much like you see today on social media, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Really? That sort of thing happens on social media? You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, no, I thought it was really interesting how he did come out and say that. And then And then it became very clear that, like, these guys going around in these trucks were, like, government agents engaged in an act of genocide. And they were using the purge as a cover mm -hmm. for it. And, you know, like, because then all the deaths, you know, basically they would just target sick, poor people. And, you know, then they would, you know, tout like, or any the low any hapless person they happened to pass on the street because the Shane and his wife, they were trying to get home before the purge. Yeah. And then this gang behind me, one of them cut, cut, a, cut the fuel line on their car mm -hmm. and caused them to break down because they were targeting them. And so they were just called out happenstance in downtown L.A. I can't think of a more also, like, I'm just frightening saying, place why, to be. Why are you guys in a car like, you know, two hours before like purge time? Like, what are you doing? Like Yeah. Like, I, I, think, I do question the. the I was like, "Where's your planet, honey? Come on, <laughs> like get your shit together. Like, you know, there's going to be a mass murderous, psychotic outdoor thing happening in like a few hours, and you're going to like take a road trip in a car. Come on, really? Yeah, I, I agree because you know Ava was doing the right thing. She was running home from work to get home and lock everybody in. You know, that's what normal people would do, right? <laughs> you know, not be out doing your grocery shopping because that's what they were doing. Yeah, they were at the grocery but, store. I'm like, really? Yeah. I, I, speaking of normal, the one of the characters that really stands out to me is the daughter Callie. Mm -hmm. It's just like there, her character is just so. I don't want to say she's not sweet and innocent, obviously, but there's this like, she's trying to draw people to the good. I mean, she's trying to tell Leo Barnes, "Don't do this." Don't mm -hmm. do what you're talking about. Come on, just stay with us. Stay mm -hmm. with us for the rest of the night. It's going to be over in a few hours. It's all you got to do. I mean, I know you're wanting to do something for your son, but would your son really want you to do this? And I just, I found, because he, he, and even that, Leo makes the comment to, to Ava, the mother, and says, you got a really special daughter here. You need to take care of her. I mean, even in the midst of all the anger and the pain and the bloodlust that he's feeling, he can, he can truly see into this girl and really like, a, this kid's special. You know, yeah. we need to like preserve this one as much as we possibly can, which I thought was very cool. And she had a tough side. I mean, she was all about what Carmelo was saying, and you know, and and all of that stuff. And what do you think about the character of Carmelo? Um, she, he's 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 an interesting uh, interesting specimen of a of a character. Brent, I'll I'll let you take that one first. Wait, which one was Carmelo? Uh, uh the resistance leader. Oh, right. So like the thing about him too, and I was wondering is like, when is this character going to show up? Because like, and you know, they, they kind of like hint at him early on in the movie, mm -hmm. 
And then you just don't get any indication that he exists at all. And then he comes in very much like Han Solo style, like unexpected when they're like being hunted in like the, the arena for the rich people. And they're like, oh, okay, we're going to turn this around. And they used it to attack the, the rich people's little arena thing. And that what I thought was funny was that they used explosives that were like over class four or whatever. And like the yeah. computer was just like, you will be prosecuted. Be- rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and they just came in with the, I don't even think that they didn't even have ARs. They had AKs. <laughs> they yeah, were they had like them. AKs and like handguns and stuff. And they just like mowed everybody down. And it was like you said earlier, like the, the woman's like, oh no, they're killing us. And she was like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, bitch. Like now you know what it's like, huh? And that fun. Yeah. That's not fun, isn't it? <laughs> well, what was your take on him, Brian? Oh, I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I was Brentley, were you done? I'm so sorry. Oh, I mean, I just, I, I kind of thought that he was just, um, you know, and you would think that something like that would evolve. Like mm-hmm. it makes sense to have a character doing that in that role because there would naturally you know be like this resistance people would organize that realize that there was a slow genocide happening and they would fight back um i think wasn't also one thing i noticed was like the guy one of the guys with them i think was the homeless dude from the first movie the 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 second the first guy that came in through the door after they threw the grenade that was dante from the right uh, yeah yeah same guy right he was in Mm -hmm. i was like i'm pretty sure that's the guy yeah. Uh, so I thought that was interesting and I noted that and I was like, okay, cool. That's nice. Nice to see some continuity there. Um, But yeah, I liked the, you know, he, he just seems a little, I, I guess it's just uh, my problem with the character is that, is that he's just kind of like a little cliche. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I feel like every time there's a militant uh, rebel leader, um, they have this sort of same like vibe about them. And it just, he felt just a little cliche to me. That's kind of I get the I get the idea, just like happened after the French Revolution, you got Napoleon. What happened after the Russian Revolution? You got Lenin and Stalin. I feel that Carmelo is that stereotypical resistance leader that if he ever wins, will become just as much of a dictator as the NFFA and just turn it around on the people that he hated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For for my for my part, I kind of like thought Carmelo had kind of that quality of V for Vendetta. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a less theatrical and more campy sort of way. I mean, yeah, there's like militant overtones to this guy and I get it, but it's like, there was a line and I'm trying to find if I jotted it down or not. Um, where, Oh gosh, where is it? Oh darn. Apparently I didn't, but he's like, yeah, we're we're going we're going to show you we're the resistance fighters, and I'm like, oh, okay, we're resisting unto what end here? What are we trying to accomplish? I don't know. Um, I just I just I found this character interesting. I think they're setting him up for a lot more different stuff in the following movies, which we'll probably all wind up reviewing at some point. But um, I, I kind of like the whole you know I'm on the internet thing and I'm like showing you or talking to you and I'm trying to build this following of people to like get you over to my side. I thought that was well done. Um, can we talk, can we talk about the, the dinner party for a second? Because there's some stuff in there that just absolutely cracked me up. The, just, the auction or the, yeah, the, the auction. Okay. Yeah. Not, not auction. her, not the domestic violence situation that we, Oh no, we, 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 we can get, we can get to that too. I mean, cause yeah. there's, some, <laughs> there's some crazy stuff went down with that. Yeah. Go for it, man. Talk. I thought the use of irony with that auction was just mm-hmm. amazing the way they did it. Cause here they're playing this beautiful piece of classical piano music. I think it was like, um, it wasn't blue Danube. It was something else. I'm forgetting now what it was or Claire de Lune. I think it's Claire de Lune. They're playing Claire de Lune on the piano and they're having this auction and, you know, the lady who's up there running it is dressed in this wonderfully elegant dress and so are all the party goers. They're tuxedos. With Barbara Bush vibes. Definitely have Barbara Bush vibe. Yeah, yeah. Four million dollar bitch. Um, (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you get that line. So, yeah. Anyway. um, And it's just, and what they're auctioning off are people to hunt. And it's like no one's like sitting here going, and what oh, what got me the two sisters with the, with the machetes, I tell you what, talk about a couple of women that will shank a bitch. 
Those two will absolutely take somebody out, man. I mean, sil stainless steel, silver, you know, machetes. They're like sharpened to like to shave the whiskers off your face or whatever. And I'm like, dang, do not mess with these two chicks. I'll tell you what. I mean, the dad and his sons. Eh, okay, who yeah. Cares? yeah, but the sisters were like that. That cracks me up. Absolutely and, cracks me up. And the view of the rich people watching and the announcer watching from behind the glass, you know, the glass window um when um leo first kills you know uh one of their own she was like <gasps> like you're not supposed to do that and just the reactions and the fact that they're not even giving these people weapons it's completely dark there's mm -hmm. not they give the hunters night vision goggles and any weapon they want but the victims are completely unarmed so mm -hmm. it's not a fair fight at all yep. Give them weapons, arm them, and then then it then it's a competition. Yeah, I mean th th this is worse. This is worse than the Roman gladiator games. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least the gladiators in the arena had weapons. This is just and like you know, and sunlight. <laughs> yeah, this is just eh, we'll just let them in there be slaughtered, and we'll have our entertainment watching them try to stay alive and just see yeah, how exactly. long they can do it. But it is a good it is a good example of how psychopaths and other people with like severe personality disorders view mm -hmm. normal people. They see them as just prey to be used for their own gratification, you know, not yeah. even as full people. Mm -hmm. And they can just treat you like a fucking object, like something just to be slaughtered mercilessly for entertainment purposes and discarded. And, and it's, it's like, and it, it, that's true, you know, and that's kind of what I like about the movies is that it does sort of allow you to see the psychopathic mindset sort of played out in a scenario so that you can really viscerally understand how these people behave and, and, and how they like think about others. Mm, absolutely. And like you said, it was a, a contrast between the, the classy, type that you would see at any celebrity or charity auction but yeah they're auctioning off people to kill yeah yeah it just it just kind of mind-boggling now the dinner party scene now that was something else i mean man you talk about a study in characters i mean first you've got you know little miss party girl who's like you know getting down on wine and pills Mm -hmm. and, and 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 that never really got explained as to the why i mean is she just a party girl or is like there's something else driving this or this is her way of getting through the night knowing uh, what it is you know yeah. i think and, it was both i mean she worked with a ava you know so ava knew mm -hmm. her but she kind of struck me as a bit of a loose woman which turned out that she indeed was so <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, the yeah, 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 definitely she was that. When you um, grab the crotch of your brother-in-law in front of your sister, you know. Yeah, that was kind of that was ballsy. That was ballsy. <laughs> I thought that was a nice little twist there. It was just like surprise. So, like... so, did, so did he apparently? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was just like really funny. And it's another example of how like the whole movie, it's just like frying pan into the fire. Like every mm -hmm. time they go from one scene to the next, it's I like it they're like, safe for like a hot second. And then it's like all of a sudden it's yeah. just like gunfire and, and craziness and they have to run. And it's like rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And, yeah. Leo thought he was getting a car to go finish his business. Nope. No car. And no then car. Uh, sister-in-law starts shooting everybody in the living room up. And he has to protect his new friends, which he didn't want in the first place. And then poor dad is left. His entire family is dead and he's just left in the apartment alone. There's another one I felt really sorry for. Yeah. And, and he's trying to be, you know, in the midst of all this insanity that's going on. He's like, look, whatever's mine in here is yours. You need a T-shirt, mm -hmm. go get a T-shirt. You want right. food, eat food. You want something to drink, drink something. It's like, while you're here, you're welcome. And then, you know... It's it's like you guys said, in the midst of this this oasis, everything just blows up. Just like, you know, completely random. Well, I shouldn't say random. I mean, the guy's wife was like messing around with her sister. And just like, oh, yeah. You know, but yeah, I just the way the way that the writers used irony overall. And also and also another thing that I thought was interesting were like those moments of redemption. I mean. Throughout the movie. They're always wondering, is is Sergeant Leo Barnes, is he coming back for us? Is he coming? And they ask themselves this over and over and over again. And then finally, toward the end of the movie, 
he looks at, I think it was uh, the daughter, Callie. He says, I am coming back for you. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, I said, this guy has been redeemed. Because up to that point, he still could have cut them loose at any point he wanted to. He still acted like he wanted to cut them loose. He tried. A couple yeah, of he times. tried to cut the couple of them loose a couple of times. But then, you know, his character is redeemed there. And then at the end, when everybody thinks he's walking into the house to kill the guy who took who murdered his son, and then you see him walking out of the house, and then who saves him? It's the man that everybody thought that Leo Barnes had killed. Right. And I'm like, yeah. But Leo Barnes purged. He purged. He just didn't do it violently. I mean, he had the guy at mm-hmm. knife point, and yep. he told him everything he wanted to tell him. You know, think about my son. Look what you did. You know, he purged. He had a catharsis. Mm-hmm. He just didn't mm-hmm. do it violently. But they mm-hmm. made it look like he did because he walked out covered in blood and, <laughs> and, and and all that. And you're like, oh, he killed the guy. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. boom, Big Daddy shoots him, and then the guy that he was going to kill Shoots big that good shot too. Guy was a good shot. Got him right between the eyes from all the way from the house. And yeah, he, he was gonna he was gonna like when the two lady when Ava and Callie came running, you know, when, when Big Daddy's goons were coming in right behind him, the the guy that saved him pulled up his gun too. He was gonna continue to fight for him, you know, if yeah. that had turned into another shootout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then unbelievably, the purge sirens go off, and everybody's just like, "Oh, I guess we're gonna stop now." (laughs) It's just like I just find it so not believable. Like, like your adrenaline's pumping. Like, which which leads me back to the question: If you try to kill somebody on purge purge night, or somebody tries to kill you and you kill them, and their friend is still alive, do you have to worry about that person coming for you the very next purge? I mean, do you have to move? Yep. (laughs) every time (laughs) and also like you just it was another thing like i thought they also made the point about polite society like you have to be careful that you don't sort of like severely offend somebody in this new society because you never know if you really piss them off Mm -hmm. they can come for you on the purge yeah and i was just like that's like i mean it's kind of like a little bit of a derivative of like you know an armed society as a polite society but also mm-hmm. just like it's it's a lot more dark than that. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing I thought that the uh, the 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 writing and the storyline has a very dark view of humanity, because I like I said yeah. I don't think most people would go along with this whole shenanigans. I just don't think it would it would fly. No, I I I think overall I think they they present the case well. The majority of people don't aren't you know down with this, and it's just a select few people that view other people as not really human you know i mean okay the one exception might be this gang behind me i think they were doing it for purely opportunistic reasons they just wanted oh, yeah. the money money they were probably po- from poor families themselves and they needed the money i can understand that but everybody else the government officials the rich people they were doing it just because they wanted to every single one of them yeah it was their right yeah, it's like, you know, on the other side of, of Redemptions, there's the transformation of Liz at the end of the movie when Shane is killed mm-hmm. and they're rescued by Carmelo Jones's men. She looks at everyone and says, I want to purge. Not I want to kill, right. not I want revenge. I want to purge. And I thought, ooh, this woman has descended into a... Which, I mean, your hu- your husband has just been killed. Yeah, if you don't have the the violence or the desire in your body for revenge at that point, I'll be frightened because either you wanted him dead or you just don't give a damn, which either way is not a good thing. But, so you would expect that instinct. But, I mean, she, like, took it down one step further. It's like, no, I'm not even about revenge. I'm not even about anything else. I just want to purge this out of my soul. Yeah, which I mean, to me, and and uh, Trace and I were discussing this backstage. To me, the irony of the purge is that it's supposed to get rid of a lot of things, but the problem is the purge just keeps perpetuating mm-hmm. what it's trying to get rid of. You know, it's trying to get rid of violence in society. It's trying to get rid of 
you know, unemployment. It's trying to get rid of crime. It's trying to get rid of everything else. So you, one night of the year, you let every base instinct inside the human person out. Well, guess what? You're just perpetuating it or maybe even making it worse, which to me is like one of the supreme ironies of the whole film and the whole series. Mm-hmm. You know, you're doing this to get rid of it, but are you really getting rid of it? Or are you just keeping it going? You know, as opposed to finding another more constructive way to deal with it. Well, when we get to the purge, the forever purge, that very thing you were just talking about is explored. What happens when you have devolved a society down to where there is no more morality? And they're also not going to follow the law anymore. So when mm-hmm. the sirens blare and they keep killing, what are you going to do? And that's exactly what the forever purge is about, when people just don't stop killing after the sirens go off. <laughs> you know. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. Ooh, creepy. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, like, it's like what's happening in Ukraine right now. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think this was a, a solid movie. I, I gave the original Purge uh, <clears throat> a B plus, but I'm going to give this one a, a solid A minus for sure. This one was. It took it to a different level. We're not just dealing with one very wealthy family and one homeless man and one house. We're dealing with, we see how people of all socioeconomic classes deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm, I could get, I could easily give it an A minus too. I mean, like I say, the writing is solid. The character acting is good. The, the, um, the chemistry between the actors and the actresses is great. Most of the plot is believable. The use of irony is just fantastic. And just the twists that are put into this movie are just great. So, yeah, I mean, I could easily give it an A minus, too. I'm very satisfied with this film. Yeah, I would give it, you know, A, A minus. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a definitely evolution upon the original mm-hmm. concept. We see the expansion outward. Now we're seeing it at a, at a different level instead of just like one family, we're seeing it at the society level. And it's very, you know, it was an entertaining film. Like it was very fun to watch. You know, I was constantly wondering what was going to happen next um, as they went from each scene and scenario, you know, frying pan into the fire every time. It was fun. I had fun watching yeah. it and observing it and, you know, like hoping, you know, wondering which one of the characters they were going to off. You knew somebody was going to get killed. And, uh, and as you, uh, Brian had said, Leo's redemption arc was was great. It was a complete, oh, yeah. re- re- complete redemption art. And did you notice when he was trying to convince Liz to come with them? You know, he's he's gone. I'm so sorry. Come with us. Because he was worried about her. Before, he was trying to cut these people loose. And now he's yeah. trying to pull them along. Yeah. That, that, that I thought, yeah. I mean, I mean, Frank Grillo, and we've all discussed it in one form or another this evening, that, you know, Frank Grillo is a really good actor. I mean, he's mm-hmm. never going to be the leading man in a lot of films. But man, you talk about a solid actor that can really play a character very well. He got into this guy's skin and just played him brilliantly. I mean, I, I there's very little about his character that I have any complaint about. I don't think I have any at all as far as how he did it. I thought it was fantastic. And uh, be prepared for Dante in election year. We see a whole lot more about Dante. You know, we've seen little glimpses of Dante in the Purge and this movie. But now the the third one, Dante really shines, and he's the. I said he didn't have much to say in this movie, but he kind of takes off. He's in a, he'll he'll be another one that has a really good arc. Cool. Well, all right, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, as always. I'll have their links below. But uh, Brian, tell everybody where they can find you. I've got channels on YouTube and on Rumble. You can find me at the Front Porch Conservative. I'm on Twitter at the Front Porch C1. I'm also on Gitter and uh, Gitter sounds so southern. Gitter and uh, Truth Social, and um, and uh, yeah, you can find me most anywhere I, tomorrow. Well, whenever on a regular basis on Saturday mornings, ten thirty a.m. Eastern. I have a live stream on YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. It's called Front Porch Brunch, where I discuss with uh, folks in the audience news items from the previous week. And, uh, you know, stop by, sub to the channel. Love to have you. Drop on by anytime you want. We just, we're a friendly bunch on Saturday mornings. So you just come on over.
Ridley? Uh, you can find me on Dangerous Rhetoric at uh, YouTube and Rumble. And um, let's see, it's Brentley on Instagram and TikTok. All one word. Well, I can't recommend these two channels and uh, social medias high, uh, higher. They're they're great people. They're they're fun. They're catchy. They're, they'll also educate you on a lot of things. And uh, guys, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, we'll we'll see everybody in about probably a week, week and a half, as we do the third movie, The Purge Election Year. And uh, until next time. Thanks so much, Tracy. Thanks, Tracy.